We're in Luke chapter 8. Um, just a quick little reminder, I've been thinking about this, that um, if you have an electronic device like a phone or an iPad and you're following along on that, you know, you actually can download notes for the studies each time that we meet. If you go to the church website, you can do this on your phone, um, and you, at the top of the website, you'll see a tab or something that will say downloadable notes. And if you do that, what you'll do is you'll get downloaded my, it's a Word document, and it'll go right to your phone or right to your tablet or whatever, and you can follow along and jot down some notes and, and, and all like that. Um, or, if you want, you can wait until uh, Lori next week will post my full set of notes if you missed something. But in those downloadable notes, like if there's a video or something, there'll be a link to the video so you can go back and, and check out the video. And some of them are funny, some of them are not so funny, but whatever. So, we're in Luke chapter 8. Um, Luke was a doctor. He was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He writes this book while Paul was in prison. And while he, in order to write this book, he uses use of older documents such as the Gospel of Mark, as well as extensive eyewitness accounts. This is a, an historical book. Jesus' ministry has begun, and the people are amazed at the things that he says and the things that he does. What he says and what he does. And we're in chapter 8, starting in verse 19 this morning. Verse 19, then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. There's so many people around him. Now, let me just stop for a second and talk about his mother and his brothers. See, Jesus had a mother. You, you all know that. Everybody, we all agree on this fact. Jesus had a mother. Where we disagree is the fact that he actually also had brothers and sisters. Matthew is the one that tells us about the, about the girls. Um, uh, not... I'm not meaning to rag on anybody, but I want you to know that the Roman Catholic Church teaches what's called the perpetual virginity of Mary. The idea is that Mary was not just a virgin when Jesus was born. We all agree to that, about that. The Bible tells us that. But they also teach that she remained a virgin for the rest of her life. And when we get to passages like this, and it mentions his mother and brothers, Houston, we have a problem. So what do we do with this? Well, uh, some claim that maybe these are uh, from Joseph. Joseph had a previous marriage, and maybe these are like stepbrothers and sisters or something like that. Some suggest, well, maybe he, these are, it's not brothers, they're cousins or something like that. But I, I, I just, just to be upfront with you, there's no mention of this in the Bible. Um, when Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, there's no mention of other children along for the ride. When Jesus is born, there's no mention of other kids in the manger. When Joseph takes Jesus and Mary to Egypt, Matthew records that, there's no mention of other kids along for the ride. We've got we to gotta get a large hotel room with you know, two extra beds, you know. It doesn't talk about that. A simpler answer, and usually, friends, the simple answers are the best. Uh, the simple answer is that actually Mary didn't remain a virgin. I don't know why we have to claim that she remained a virgin. Um, she had kids. It's a good thing to have kids. Nothing wrong with having kids. Joseph and Mary had kids. They had other boys. They had, other, they had some girls after Jesus was born. Now, I'm going to stop and talk about something. I want to talk about his family, because I, and I'm calling the lesson here from skeptic to believer, because it is interesting to note that when you track Jesus' family through the Gospels, that his brothers actually didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in him. Mark records the event that we're looking at here in, in Luke, and just before this event, uh, Mark records this. Then the multitudes came together again so they could not so much as eat bread. There's just too many people, can't even set up a, a lunch line. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold on of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. Now, some people say that his own people, just as maybe his friends or something, I'd like to suggest to you it's probably his family. And they think that he's, he's, well, they think he's gone a little crazy. You know, this is wild. What are you doing? How, how are you doing all this stuff? 
John records that at one point in his ministry, his brothers were even taunting him. This is in John chapter 7. It says, but soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. You can do, if you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. It says, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. So see, they're just taunting him. They're just taunting him. James is one of those brothers who didn't believe in Jesus. But that changed. That changed. His brothers didn't stay unbelievers. Now, after Jesus was raised from the dead and before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, I want you guys to hang out here in Jerusalem and wait for the coming of of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what the disciples did. They, they hung out, this is in Acts chapter one, going into Acts chapter two. They hung out in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit, but look who's in the group waiting. In Acts 1.14 it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So sometime after the resurrection, something changed. What happened to his, James and his brothers? How did they come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah? Paul gives us the clue. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes this. He says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And in other words, this is a tradition that was handed down to him. He says, here's the tradition, this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Let me just stop here for a second, go a little bit off track. Paul's testimony about the resurrection here in 1 Corinthians 15 is quite amazing. It is actually one of the, one of the first accounts written down. It was actually written, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians before the Gospels were written down. And uh, we think this was written around 55 A.D., and so this language that he uses when he says, I share with you that which I've also received. In other words, there had been things handed down. And we think that when did he receive this, this, this tradition that Jesus died and was raised on the third day? Well, in Acts 9, which is around, the, around A.D. 35, that's after Paul had seen the resurrection, resurrected Christ himself and then went to Jerusalem and, and find out what's going on. And he receives the traditions. Now, see, there are people who will tell you that you know, the resurrection of Jesus was a story that people made up hundreds of years later. And yet, if you track the history, no, it, goes right, it dates right back to the time that Jesus died and rose again. This isn't made up. See, people have the goofiest ideas. They're just the goofiest ideas. Now, Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15 and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter's Aramaic name, that's the same as the apostle Peter. He was seen by Peter, then by the 12, that's the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Now, he says, so there's, there was over 500 people over 500 people that saw the resurrected Christ. And Paul says that in A.D. 55, when he's writing, most of them were still alive. And he's saying to the Corinthians, you want to you you check it out? You, 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 I'll give you their email. Well, I don't they'd have an email address, did they? And so Paul's saying that by 55 A.D., there's, all these people are still alive. And then he says in verse 7, after that, he was seen by James. That's the half-brother of Jesus. Then by all of the apostles, because there's more apostles than just the 12. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Jesus appeared in his resurrected body to James, his brother who didn't believe. Now James, the tradition tells us that by the age of 94, James was stoned by the Jews and had, the, had his head bashed in with a club. He died a horrible martyr's death. And he went to his grave proclaiming the same message that all the disciples, that all the apostles, that all the witnesses proclaimed 
and that was that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, if this was just something made up, I can see one or two of them going to their grave. But all of them dying horrible martyrs' deaths, claiming the same thing that Jesus indeed rose from the dead after three days. They were given chances to change their story, but rather than change their story, they chose to die for the Lord. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because it's possible that there might be some of you here this morning who were like James before the resurrection and that you're a skeptic. And you know what? It's not, it's not all that bad to be a skeptic. It's a good thing to ask questions. It's a good thing to ask questions. But I've got to tell you, there's answers to your questions. Um, there are many, many pieces of evidence that support historical truth that Jesus lived, that he died, that he was actually dead, that he was buried. We know where he was buried, that they recorded where he was buried, and that three days later, he rose from the dead. This is from the video, The Case for Christ. This is just two of many. They, they seem like little small things, but there's just two of many, many On pieces of On the first of day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Luke 24, 1. The empty tomb story also has a very embarrassing feature of it that is preserved in the memory of the early church, namely the discovery of the empty tomb by women. Now, in order to appreciate this, you have to understand something of the status of women in Palestinian Jewish society. In that society, which was a patriarchal society, women were frankly second-class citizens. If you were going to invent an account about an empty tomb, then why on earth would you invent witnesses, primary witnesses, whom no one would believe. In fact, they would scoff at that later on. Supposing you were inventing the story of the resurrection of Jesus, many people have said, oh, this was all just dreamed up later on. Well, how would you have done that? The one thing you wouldn't have done would have been to have not only a woman, but a woman who's got, uh, nobody quite knows what, but a fairly shady past as your prime witness. And yet there she is, Mary Magdalene in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and particularly in John. And already by the middle of the second century, the pagans are sneering, oh, this is just based on the testimony of hysterical women, you can't believe that. But the early Christians stuck to their story, they stuck to their guns, they stuck to the women. They said, this is how it was. Now, they just would never have made that up. And that actually has enormous ramifications. If this is how the story was, and they didn't change it um, to airbrush Mary out, then this really must have been what happened on that first Easter day. The chief priests devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Matthew 28, 12 and 13. Matthew reports that the Jewish authorities were claiming that the disciples of Jesus had stolen his corpse. And this is verified by Justin and Tertullian a little bit later on, saying that the Jewish leaders were still saying the same thing in their day. Now here's the question. If the body is still in the tomb, why are you saying that the disciples had stolen it? Well, if you think about that, the claim that the body was stolen confirms that Jesus' enemies acknowledged that the tomb was empty. If you've got a stolen body, you must have an empty tomb. If the tomb was not empty, Jesus' opponents would surely have gone and got the body and shown it as soon as the disciples began proclaiming the resurrection. If you are a skeptic, I just simply want to challenge you to look at the historical evidence. There are hundreds of pieces of evidence. Uh, for the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. See, Jesus is somebody you can trust your life to. He's not like any other. Not like any other. Now back to our text. I, I know I've just done one verse. Let's do, let's do another verse. Verse 20. So his family shows up and they want to see him. And it was told by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Now, 
you might wonder what kind of people are important enough to interrupt a meeting that Jesus is having. You know, who can interrupt Jesus? Well, you would think that his family would be important enough to interrupt Jesus. Well, Jesus takes that concept and he redefines who his family is. And he says, my mother and brother are those who hear the word of God and do it. Um, and I want to talk for a few minutes about God's family DNA. Um, your families all we, all, we all like carry traits in our families. You know, like yours is the family where the men go bald, you know, by age 25 or something like that. Or maybe yours is the family where it's got lots of redheads or... Or, or mine, you're, you're the family with a big nose, you know. We, you, you know, you, we, we have, you can, there's traits to families. Well, there are traits to God's family. If you're going to be in God's family, first, God tell you, God needs to be your father. We, we call this being born again when this happens. The Bible says that each of us were born into the world in the, into a state of sin. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us. And, and because of that, we're separated from God. So how can we get reconnected to God? Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You want to get close to God? You have to be born again. John 3.3. 3. When we get to the point where we begin to realize that we are sinners and that Jesus actually bridged the gap between a sinful me and a holy God. And Jesus did that by dying for me, by dying for us. He died on the cross as a sacrifice. He paid for our sin. When I, when I begin to realize that, I'm close. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm close. Because knowing that isn't enough. You have to actually put your life into his hands. You have to trust him. You have to believe in him. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so when you trust Jesus, something changes. You become born again and you're now able to connect with God. Now when that happens and you're born, you're born again, Jesus gives us two characteristics of of what it's like to be a part of his family, uh, to be his mothers and brothers. The first characteristic, he says, is it's those who are hearing God's word. If you are God's child, you will hear his voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, I believe that sometimes God can speak to us directly. I actually believe that. Um, but I also believe, in my advanced old age, in my many years of experience, that sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's God speaking to me or whether it's the pepperoni pizza I had last night. Or maybe you forgot to say leave off the anchovies or something like that. It's hard to tell sometimes if it's God because I've had all people tell me all kinds of stuff that they say God has told them. And some of them sure seems absolutely right. Some of it not so much. See, the clearest way you and I can hear God's voice is by that book we're studying. This is the clearest way. This is this because we know that he's already spoken in it. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every Good work. The word that's translated inspired means that God has actually breathed it out. <sighs> he's breathed it out into the authors. And when you're reading it, he speaks. He speaks. Now to hear God's word, I've got to tell you that you actually need to spend time listening to it. Because sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we're like, have you ever had a conversation with a person who's always interrupting you and you never quite get a whole sentence out because they're just always interrupting you? Does anybody know anybody like that? Well, if you don't, I want to introduce you to somebody. Here we go. 
Hey Murph. <laughs> hey Ronathan. I heard you're having trouble with your computer. Yeah, thanks for coming down. Okay, so what's uh, what seems to be the problem? Uh, so every time I try to get online, uh -huh. it's asking me for an admin okay. password, sure. but it shouldn't need a password to get onto the internet. Sure. And I should already yeah. have admin privileges on this computer. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Did you get all that? Yeah, yeah, totally. So you need admin privileges? No, no, no. Yeah. I already have yeah. admin privileges. Oh, okay. I just Great. need to get on the internet. And okay, it, yeah. It, I shouldn't need admin privileges. Yeah, to get on the yeah, yeah. Got it. I feel like you're not actually uh -huh, listening uh -huh. to me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Are you yeah, actually okay. not listening to yeah, me? No, or are you saying that you okay, get sure. that it seems yeah, that totally. way? Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Okay, you need to stop sure. that. Okay, doing what? You need to stop checking in okay, with me so right. much saying okay. yeah. You need to stop yeah. saying yeah. What do you mean? It seems like you're not listening oh, and you're just focusing got on it. saying yeah, yeah no, that got makes it sense. and everything. Yeah. Like you took yeah, some okay. kind of active oh, listening oh, class, sure. but yeah, you're not actually totally, paying attention. Totally. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Then why did you disagree with me a million times while I said it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm just showing you that I'm listening to you. So you have a problem with your dog, is what I'm hearing? No, what you're it's... clearly yeah. not listening to me. Just shut up. Shut, sure. up. Okay. shut up. Sure. Shut up. Sure. Shut up. Sure. Shut up. Yeah. Shut up. Okay. Shut up. Okay, sure. Shut up! Okay. Don't talk. Don't yeah, talk for sure. a second. Sure. Oh, totally. oh got so, you. totally, totally. Okay, okay. If you're actually listening to me, why don't you tell me what I just said? To hear God's voice, you've got to give him time to speak and not interrupt him. Um, I think sometimes we, sometimes we spend so, many, so much time doing other things while we're reading and our mind wanders. And give him time. Learn to listen. That's a part of our DNA is hearing his voice. Second thing, it's not just hearing, but it's obeying God's word. If you're a child of God, you will learn to obey his word. You'll learn that there are things that you're doing that God thinks are wrong. And you'll take the steps to do something about it. Jesus told a story about two men who would go through a great storm, and these two men built two houses. In Matthew 7, he says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. See, everybody's going to go through storms. The question is, are you going to survive the storms? And the survivability is, is not just about hearing his word, but learning to do it. James wrote, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I know people who know a lot of the Bible and they can quote you all kinds of verses. And they've read the Bible all kinds of times. But they don't do it. They're deceiving themselves. Just reading the Bible, just coming to church. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know that you get any, I shouldn't tell you this. But I don't think you get brownie points from God just by showing up at church. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> I hope half of you don't stay away next week, but... You don't get brownie points for showing up. God doesn't want you just to be here. God wants you to hear and then learn how to do it. I like Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, where Paul says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. In other words, when you are born again, God's at work in your life. And God wants to do a couple things in your life. He wants to produce in you the desire, the will to do what he wants. And so he'll start working on that. He'll start working on your heart, changing your heart. But he also is at work to help you do God's will. He wants to be there to help you actually take that step and do what he wants. I know I've shown this video a million times. If you've seen it a million times, do what I do and learn from it anyway. Laura. Hey, Lord. So how did it go with Kat? Did you talk to her? Oh, well, Lord, not exactly. <laughs> well, did you forgive her? 
Well, Lord, I mean, I was just thinking, like, why should I forgive her? <laughs> because I asked you to. Well, yeah, I know you did, Lord, but why? Well, you shouldn't have to know why, just that I asked you to do it. Well, that doesn't make any sense, Lord. I mean, you don't understand the situation. Kathleen has an attitude problem. Well, Laura, you believe that I know what is best for you and for Kat? Well, yeah, Lord. Then you'll do this. But, Lord... This is no different than when I've asked you to do anything else. Well, yes, this is, Lord. This is way different. When I asked you to quit your job, you quit. Well, of course, Lord, but I didn't like my job, so I was happy to leave, you know? I mean, this is way different. Okay, Lord, you know what? I've got an idea. How about we give it a week and I'll pray about it? Uh, I'll give you my answer now. Uh, but, Lord... Look, Kat's coming by here very soon. She's coming okay? by here? Yes. Well, let's go. Now's your no. chance to talk to no. her. I want you to but forgive Lord, her. Lord, you don't understand. Hey! hey. Laura, hi. hi. It's been like hi. two wow. weeks since we've had coffee. Yeah. Oh, it has. We should totally get together this week. Oh, wow, I can't do that. I am so busy. Oh, yeah. Well, how about next week? Well, you know, actually, I don't think it's going to happen for a while. Oh, well, is everything okay? Oh, yeah, everything's great. Uh-huh. All right. Um, I guess I'll just um, see you later then. Bye. Lord, did you hear that attitude? I thought you were going to forgive her. I thought you said we could wait a week, Lord. No, you said that. Oh, okay, Lord, you're being unreasonable, okay? Why don't you just go talk to Kathleen and have her come to me and ask for my forgiveness? Laura, you need to obey. I want you to forgive Kat. But, Lord... Why do you keep calling me Lord? You won't even do what I ask. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. Now a couple things here. He says, Let us cross over. I, just wanna, I know this is a technical thing. I just want to point this out. He did not say let us cross under to the other side. I just want to make sure that you, you get this. He says, let us cross over to the other side. This isn't going to be a submarine voyage. This is going to be on top of the water. Are you, you with me? Okay. Is anybody awake? Did I, have I lost you already? Oh, my gosh. And he said, let us go over to the other side. Now, this is a phrase you don't typically, I don't pay attention to often. It happens, it actually appears 15 times in the New Testament. All, four, all of them in the four Gospels. And it usually carries this same idea. In Jesus' day, the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, and actually it's the northwestern part of the Sea of Galilee, was where the Jews lived. Because remember, during the Babylonian captivity, they'd all been wiped out and scattered. But when they were brought back, it's not really till about 100 or 200 B.C. that they actually start settling the northern area up by the Sea of Galilee. And they settled around this part of the Sea of Galilee, around here and then over out to here. The, wet, the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee was where all the Gentiles lived, all the pagan, pig dog, heathen Gentiles. And the Jews called that the other side. That's where the other people lived, who do the other things, who eat that other kind of food. So this is kind of what he's talking about. He's going to go from the, they're, they're going to go on a boat ride to the pagan side. That comes up in next week's study. Just but just hold on to that. So verse 23. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. Now it says as they sailed, he fell asleep. So. The voyage starts and Jesus falls asleep, but then the storm comes up and he's still asleep in the boat. Okay. And it says a windstorm came down on the lake. There are two Greek words that combine to translate the word windstorm. The worst, first one is lilops, which is a, a violent attack of wind, a storm breaking forth from black thunder clouds in furious gusts. The second word that's also a part of this sentence is anemos, Wind, a violent agitation, and a stream of air, a very strong, tempestuous wind. So this is all, this is all used to describe this windstorm. Back in 2007, on, on, our, on my first trip to Israel, um, we were up on top of Mount Arbel, which is on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And it's the highest point around the Sea of Galilee. You can overlook the whole, the whole lake. And this is from that 
trip. Actually, I'm, in as much as I feel sorry for you having this kind of wind and cold uh, temperatures, I'm glad you get to experience that simply because that's exactly what I believe the disciples had experienced then when, look, we just came from the northern area of the Sea of Galilee. Now you can hardly see it. The clouds are approaching so fast when the wind blows from the west and brings all those clouds. And then, of course, you have the afternoon regular Sharkia, we call it in Arabic. Shark in Arabic is east. Sharkia is the eastern winds that are traditionally in the afternoon. In fact, in the history books, in, even in the Jewish Talmud, it says, if you happen to cross the lake and you've got to be on the other side in the afternoon, don't even think about coming back. Just stay there the night because you're risking your life. The winds are so strong. Can you imagine an afternoon when there is a storm approaching from the west and the regular eastern winds are taking place? The collision in this basin of those two winds alone can create, listen to me, it can create a six to eight foot high waves. Wow. Now, that's just a tiny lake. You can imagine what these kind of waves uh, look like in the middle of a small lake, like, uh, small lake like that. And even the most experienced Sir. fishermen, native to the area, will be helpless in a situation like that. Now, just the, 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 the earlier that day, we were on the other side of the lake, we, and and we had no idea this was happening. But the the wind, the uh, the clouds come from the Mediterranean from the west. The Sharkia comes up, and suddenly we were in the middle of this of this storm. It was wild. It was wild. Just a little little teeny taste. And I'm sorry that the camera is so shaky, but it was cold and it was windy, and I didn't have my tripod. So it just adds a little more realism to it, doesn't it? There we go. And it says they were filling with water. We're talking about the boats filled with water, not the disciples. Just to be clear about that. And it says they were in jeopardy. So in a way, the disciples are kind of like they're being tested. And how are they going to respond? you got 15 seconds. <laughs> Sorry. In our lives... Sometimes we're surrounded by storms. And even though Jesus is in your boat, it seems like he's asleep. You're being tested. You got 15 seconds to respond. Your answer, verse 24, and they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. The word they use for master is kind of interesting. It's epistates. It means any sort of superintendent or overseer. It's not the typical word for Lord, which is kurios. Um, it's kind of like they're calling him boss. Boss, boss, you know, the, the plane, the plane, no, no, something like that. It's a word only found in Luke. Keep in mind, these guys are able-bodied seamen, most of them. They're fishermen. I don't think they're waking up Jesus because they forgot how to sail the boat. They're waking them up because we're sinking. We're sinking. Master, master, we are perishing. Then he arose, verse 24, and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was calm. He arose and he rebuked the wind. Mark records the actual words that Jesus speaks when he rebukes. Um, and we think that Mark is actually... We think that Mark's main source of information was the apostle Peter's, and Peter was there. And so this is, Peter remembered what Jesus actually said. In Mark 4.39 it says, Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now, that's a very pretty, this translation. Peace, be still. Look at the words. The actual words, peace is siapao, to be silent, to hold one's peace. Shut up. It means shut up. The word be still, famao, to close the mouth with a muzzle. So, it's like Jesus stands up and says, shut up and put a muzzle on it. That's, that's quite a rebuke. I just, I just love that. I'm sorry. I, just, I think that's just hilarious. In verse 25, and he said to them, where is your faith? 
and they were marveled, and they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Who can this be? Jesus is being obeyed by things that we classify as forces of nature, not things with personality or will. This is creation responding. You are getting a peek at the deity of Jesus, of just who he is. I, I love that song we were singing this morning, The Great I Am. Uh, demons flee before him in his presence. Um, he is the creator who is commanding his creation. He can do anything. He can do anything. We've been singing this song, this It Is Well song lately, and the words in the bridge go like this. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. They still know his name. The storms that you're going through right now, the winds and the waves, you know what? They know his name. They know his name. There's nothing too difficult for him. Nothing too difficult for him. And he says to them, where is your faith? Some people look at this as if Jesus is saying to the disciples that they should have stood up and rebuked the wind and waves too. And I got, I got news for you. I, I don't think that's the point. I think the issue is not their faith to do this, but it's their faith in Jesus. They shouldn't have freaked out because Jesus was on board their boat. And after all, remember what Jesus said at the beginning that started this three-hour tour? On a three-hour tour. Remember what he said? He said, let us go over. He didn't say let us go under. He said, let us go over. The disciples had actually gotten to the place where they started to think that Jesus didn't even care about them. Mark tells us that. It says, but he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him, and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You don't even care about us anymore. What is this? You're just sleeping on us. What's the problem here? I got to tell you, here's the answer, friend. You, gotta, you can trust him because he actually does care. He does care. You'll say that to him, but not in church. Oh, well, not in church you won't. See, in church we'll, we'll look at the disciples and go, how dare they say you don't care. Those, they're such bad boys, those disciples. No, and then, you, and then we go home to the troubles that we think, and we think, God, how come I'm going through this? And we'll think quietly you don't even care. He does. He does. He cares. He cares. He cares for you. Yes, he does. I, I, I do it. That's the only reason I can talk about it. I do it. You know, some stupid thing will happen to the church. Somebody will say something. I'll hurt my feelings or something, and I'll just I'll, I'll go home and I'll start worrying. The whole thing's going to fall apart. I can't tell you how many times over the last 20-some years we've, I was like, oh, no, it's all going to be, that's terrible. And I just, and, and you know what? And it goes on. God keeps going on, and it keeps going on. I kind of need this rebuke every once in a while myself. What would the situation have looked like if the disciples had acted in faith? Would they have tried to wake him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course they would have tried to wake him because he's the one that has the solution. He's the one that has the answer. But instead of rebuking Jesus for not caring, I think the answer is to simply ask him for help. Just ask him for help. There's another, there's a recording, a, a record of another person who went through a storm and he handled it a little differently. This is the Apostle Paul when he was being transported as a prisoner to Rome on a ship in the middle of the Mediterranean. Waves got even bigger in the Mediterranean. In Acts 27 it says, and when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, when Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss, 
And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought, you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. So look what Paul did. There was a period where they didn't eat. Now, maybe that's just because they were afraid of eating for some reason. I don't, or maybe they were seasick. I don't know. We, we might call that fasting. God might say, well, that's, that's waking him up. That's one way to get God's attention. That's one way to say to God, I'm serious about this. I am. I want to hear from you. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to know what you want for me. It's like Paul's been waking. He's waking him up. And, what it, and then it says that, that he was told that he was given all the people on board. What does that mean? It means Paul's been asking for them. God, give me these people. Give me their lives. God, keep, help, help them to survive this. He had been asking. Now, keep in mind, the disciples were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were right where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be in that storm because Jesus said, let's go over. And they said, okay. So they're doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe they could have just trusted him a little better. Peter would later write that we should be casting all our care upon him for he cares for you. Yes, he cares. He cares, wake him, ask, and then trust him. Isaiah wrote, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You can survive this. Yes, you can. Let's stand and pray. So, Father, I would like to ask for two things. First, I would like to ask for those maybe here who have not yet opened their heart to you and have not yet become born again. Friend, this is a chance right now to do that very thing. And I pray that God will help you to open your heart to him. He was not going to do it all by himself. You have to choose this. You have to say to him something like this. And let this be your prayer. Just say to him, God, I need you. And I make a choice today to open my heart to you. I am willing to admit I am a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. So could you forgive me? Would you come into my life? Would you make me your child? And would you help me to follow you? And I thank you for hearing me. Father, I also want to pray for those of my friends here who are going through storms. Help us to do a little better this time through the storm. Help us to make sure that we're hearing your word and we're doing it. That we're where we need to be, that we're, we're doing what we need to do. And Lord, we cry out to you, God, help us. Help us, God. Would you save us, direct us. Help us to trust and not be afraid. Thank you. In Jesus' name.